Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The uh, prophet Jeremiah preached the word of God uh, during a certain part of the history of Israel. It was right before the Babylonian captivity when uh, the Jews were finally taken to Babylon. And that uh, period of time, you see there in your outline, was from about 640 uh, B.C. to about 589 uh, B.C. Now, during that time, uh, he uh, was preaching. He preached during the reforms of Josiah because Israel had fallen into all kinds of paganism. And when Josiah became king, he began to get the people back to uh, the uh, way of uh, the Lord God, uh, renew the sacrifices in the temple, get all the pagan stuff out of it. And he started a great renewal. His kingship was followed by uh, Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim became very lax. In fact, he became almost an enemy of, of Jeremiah because Jehoiakim almost turned on his ear on its ear, all the reforms that Josiah had done. And so the prophet was pretty much after him, uh, preaching messages of, of judgment if he didn't get back uh, to doing what God was calling him to do. He finally was, uh, uh, he ended his prophecy and his time of prophecy uh, during the regency of Zedekiah. Now Zedekiah is an interesting uh, uh, name, and we're going to get back to Zedekiah in a minute. Zedekiah had been appointed by Nebuchadnezzar II, who was ruling Babylon at the time. And what happened is that he had come, up, come in, basically taken over uh, Judah and Jerusalem, and had taken captive already Jehoiakim and taken him back to Babylon. And so Zedekiah was there. There was a big rebellion during the time of Zedekiah. And uh, so they rebelled against, uh, against Nebuchadnezzar's rule. The result of that is he sends the army down to destroy the whole place, the temple, and everything. And Zedekiah tries to flee uh, the city. And as he tries to flee the city, he is uh, captured by uh, Nebuchadnezzar's forces. Uh, and uh, his sons are killed, and then he is uh, blinded and taken back to Babylon. And Jeremiah, we're not, we don't really know what happened to Jeremiah, but it is suspected by historians and biblical historians that Jeremiah was kidnapped by a group of people that were also fleeing uh, the onslaught of the Babylonians and uh, took Jeremiah and they fled into Egypt. So that is, that is what happened to Jeremiah. So, but he preached during all that period of time, a period of renewal uh, back to, to the, the law and back to the Torah, back to the <coughs> proper... Uh, uh, functioning of the priests in the temple and what the king's supposed to do through a kind of a, a laissez-faire uh, reign and then finally uh, through a re rebellion. So he had a very interesting life. <coughs> Chapter 33 from which our text was taken this morning, our Old Testament text, is the beginning of a section that is about three, three chapters or so, two or three chapters, which deal with the preaching of God's intention to renew his covenant that he had made with his chosen people. So God is going to renew his covenant. And he's going to make a new covenant with the people of Israel. Not like the covenant he made of old that they broke, but he's going to make this new covenant written on their hearts. And it begins there with verse 14. It runs, I'm going to take it from 14 through 22. If you want to follow in your Bibles, you can. 14 uh, through 22. You have 14 through 16 or 17 there in the text. Uh, before you, but in the bulletin, but I want to look at chapter 33, 14 to 22. Now, the reason I want to look at this is because this is the Advent time of year in the church is a time to think about uh, the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, it is also a preparation time for celebrating the birthday of Christ, which we in tradition have celebrated in December on the 25th. But it, it really is more about... Uh, in, in the church, preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's really repair, preparing for the time when He will come again and renew all things, right? As the, as the eternal Messiah uh, for, the, for the whole of history uh, uh, and the whole of the world. But Jeremiah here is preaching to a people now in 33 who will eventually be taken into captivity in Babylon. And so he says there in the opening verses, which was our text for the, today, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will fulfill the promise I made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the Lord is going to fulfill His promise. God has promised something to Israel and Judea, and He's going to fulfill it. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. Now let's take a look at this for a moment. What is being promised here to the people of Israel? What is being promised to the Jews of Judea and Jerusalem? As the prophet is hearing from the Lord, behold, in those days declares the Lord. What days? Well, first of all, we want to know what is the promise. He's declared something in those days. So in those days, there's obviously something that's going to happen in the future. God is going to do something. He is going to fulfill the promises He made to Judah and Israel. He's going to fulfill His promise. And those promises are to restore the Holy Land. He promised to do that. He was going to restore the promised land. The promised land of Israel and of uh, uh, Judea were not necessarily restored by the coming of the uh, uh, Greek, uh, the, the Medes and Persians into Babylon. That wasn't done. When they sent the Jews back under Ezra and Nehemiah, they had Jerusalem and Judea. There was still Samaria. And there was still later what became known as Galilee, which was really uh, uh, another area altogether. So the land that he promised them, if you go back uh, to Exodus and the land that was promised from Genesis and Exodus, that's not necessarily what they got back. That land was not restored until 1948. It wasn't until 1948, and it wasn't really until after the <laughs> Six-Day War that it was really restored, right? So it couldn't have, it didn't mean just that coming back to there. Now, for the short term, it meant their renewal under Ezra and Nehemiah and King Cyrus, right? It meant that. But what is, he says, in those days, the coming days. Notice what it says in verse 15. Those days and at that time. He's harking back to the promise he made to Abraham, which was going to be renewed at the very end. Abraham was promised what? A land, right? Which he never, by the way, took possession of. He was also promised what? Descendants that would outnumber the stars in the sand. Right? So these are things that are happening at the end. So look at what the text is saying here. He says, in those days and at that time. What that tells us is it's definitely going to happen. Now if we look at the history of the world today, has this definitely happened? Does Jerusalem today rest in security? Just ask yourself that. Does the city of Jerusalem today rest in security? The answer to that question is no, it does not. It is surrounded by enemies. It is surrounded by There's always something going on there. Even when I was visiting there, some guy crashed his, his car into a police station. Right? So there's always something going on there. So Jerusalem is not resting in that sense in all security. It does have security, it does have protection, but is it in all security? So in that day and at that time, I think is really referring to something else in the prophet. And that's why this reading is read during Advent. It is a definite place and a definite time. And what is going to happen in those days? What's going to happen? A righteous branch is going to spring up from David, or spring up for David, it says in the text. Now, this is a play on words. Because who is the king? Zedekiah. And what does Zedekiah mean? Zedekiah means I'm righteous. I'm the righteous one. And he was anything but that. But what does he say here? The righteous branch. A righteous branch is going to come. One who is really righteous. Was David totally a righteous man? No, David wasn't totally a righteous man. You can go back and read his history. He had lots of problems. In fact, he had so many problems when it came time to build a temple, God said, you're not going to build it. You're a man of blood. You're not going to build it. Your son's going to build it. 
So David was he? No. This is a rice of branch that's going to come to David. And it's going to be someone that's going to secure Jerusalem and Judea forever. Forever. All right? And what is his name? He says in verse 16. This one. This righteous one. It's going to come from God. He's of the house and the lineage of David. That's what it says in Luke chapter 2 when he describes what the angel says to Mary. He will be of the house and lineage of David. So Jeremiah is being fulfilled already with the coming of Christ in the first coming of Jesus. But what about this security forever? Well, that's something that's going to happen later. The chief work of this righteous branch of David. What is going to be his chief work? His chief work is not going to be necessarily reestablishing the Davidic kingdom. His chief work is going to be salvation. That will be his chief work. He's going to save. They will dwell securely in those days. And this is the name by which you will call God is our righteousness. That's Adonai Zedekinah. Adonai Zedekinah. It is God who is righteous. It is God who is righteous. The only one that can save you is the righteous one. You cannot be saved by your own righteousness. You cannot be saved by some land or some country. You cannot be saved by some security force. You are saved by the righteous work of Jesus Christ. And that's the thing that helps you dwell in security. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You dwell in security because of the righteous one of God. God is our righteousness. Adonai. Zedekiah. That is why you are righteous. You are in security. So the prophet goes on. He doesn't just end there. He expands on this now. He expands on it in the, in the following verses, which are in the, in, not in the epistle text, but also in the text of 33. For thus says the Lord God. Again, the Lord is speaking and He's saying something. David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now, I want you to look at, if you look at the text clearly, it says, the Lord says. God is saying this. The Lord, Adonai, He's saying this that David is never going to lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. Notice what he says in 18. And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence, meaning in the presence of the Lord, to offer the burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The eternal king. So what we have here in this text is the king that is going to follow in the line of David is an eternal king. He's not a king for a season. He's not a king like those three kings that were uh, <coughs> ruling at the time of Jeremiah. Or all the kings in Israel. Go and read. It, it's almost like a, a, a gallery of, of, of scoundrels when you start reading about the kings of Judah and Israel in the Bible. They're not going to be anything like that. They're not going to be anything like that. This is going to be an eternal king. He cannot be meaning, therefore... Some king that's going to sit on the throne of David. Has that been fulfilled? Has it been fulfilled in your thinking with regard to Israel today that there is a king ruling in Israel of the line of David? There is not. There is not. They expect, they expect that to be fulfilled, yet to be fulfilled just as we do. But we know it has been fulfilled. We know the eternal king has come. We know he is reigning forever. Okay? And how do we know this? Because, again, in Luke chapter 1, the angel says to Mary, and the Lord God, the Lord God, that's, that's uh, Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, will give to him the throne of his father David. Now that's what Jeremiah is predicting here. And the angel is saying, he's going to give the throne to this one that you're going to give birth to. He's going to have the throne of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. The question then is big. Is in fact the descendant of David ruling over the house of God and God's people for all eternity? The answer to that question is... Yes, because he rose from the dead and ascended into the right hand of God. Right? So we have our reigning king. This has been fulfilled. He is the reigning king. 
but he's also the eternal priest. Notice what he says here. The Levitical priesthood will never lack having a man who will be standing before the Lord. Is Jesus Christ, after he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, is he a human being? Yes. Is he a man? Yes. Where is he? He is in the eternal throne room of God. At the right, he's ascended to the right hand of the Father, right? He's there. And there he offers. It says in Hebrews chapter 7, This one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 21. Later in Hebrews 7 24, he says this, He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save completely and at all times. He is able to save completely and at all times those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And that theme comes out of Romans chapter 8 verse 34 where Paul says, Jesus Christ who died also rose again and is at, is, is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. We have an eternal high priest. We have an eternal king and an eternal high priest just as Jeremiah said we have. The advent of our God has happened. The advent we're looking for is the renewal of all things in Him when He comes again. So, just how sure then and how solid is this prophetic promise that Jeremiah is making by the Lord God? How sure is it? So he's made this promise that there's going to be this righteous branch and, and the Lord our righteousness is going to make all this happen and Jude, Jude, Judah and Jerusalem are going to uh, rest in security and uh, there will always be a, a, a man on the throne of David. Uh, there will always be a, a, a priest uh, offering uh, acceptable sacrifice to God, etc., etc., right? How sure is this? Well, look at the text further on, 19 and following. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So again, the word of the Lord. He's saying the Lord gave me this to say. Thus says the Lord. The Lord there is Jehovah. The Lord there is uh, Adonai. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that the night, uh, that the day and the night will not come at their appointed time. If you can do that. So how sure is this promise? How sure is this promise? If Israel or anyone in the world has the power to stop this planet from rotating on its axis and its orbit around the sun, if you can stop that, then it would be possible to stop God's promise. Well, that's, a, that's a whole week's meditation right there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that's a whole week's meditation. If you could do that, all right, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne forever, and my covenant with the Levitical priests and ministers will not happen. So how sure is the promise? The promise is as sure as the God who created this universe. And the order of this universe and its planets is that sure. That's how sure it is. It cannot be broken, his promise. And he did not break it. He did not break it. Jesus did come. Jesus did save us. He is the high priest that reigns forever. He is the eternal priest and the eternal king. Okay? As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured. This harks back to Abraham's promise. The promise he made to Abraham in Genesis 15, 5 and 6. Look towards the heaven, the Lord says to Abraham. Look towards the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And it says, Abraham believed the Lord and it credited to him as righteousness. The righteousness came by faith. The righteousness came by faith. Not by Abraham counting the stars. Now we know that Abraham knows how to argue. You know, when they were looking over the uh, uh, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was talking to the angel of the Lord, and he said, well, what if there are 50 good people in that city? You can destroy that whole city for 50 good people. 
And the answer is no. And he gets it all, all the way down to, to 10. He said, even if there's 10 people there, I would not destroy the city. I would not destroy the city for the sake of the temple. Okay? So he knows how to argue with God. So he could look up at the stars and say, uh, how about a trillion? Uh, maybe three trillion? Will you go for three trillion? I mean, he could have done that and said to gain his righteousness, right? So I can do what God wants me to do, and that's count the stars. No. That is why your righteousness cannot be bound by your works or dependent on your works. Who's going to count all the stars? Who's going to go to the seashore and count all the grains of sand? You can't. Do you think by your righteousness you can get right before God? You cannot. You believe it. On the force of Jesus Christ and His work on the cross. And you are saved. And you are saved. This is what He's saying. This is what the, the prophets preached this. This wasn't something that just came up in the New Testament. It's preached by the prophets. The promise of the covenant of the eternal priest king is absolutely certain. The hearkening back to the original promise with Abraham is now renewed. This promise, the promise God made with Abraham, this is going to come to fruition. For what the scriptures say, it says, uh, 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 Paul understood this, he understood in Romans 4.3. He said, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Because he believed God. And what did he believe about God? He believed that him, an old man, could have a son. And that that one son could be the progenitor of all the faithful of billions of people that would believe on Jesus. And that is why Paul later would say, it is by faith that we are sons and daughters of Abraham. It is by faith. It is an absolutely sure, as the hosts of heaven cannot be numbered, the sands cannot, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, that is the believers who believe on righteousness by faith, and the Levitical priests who minister before me. So what are we to do with that? The Levitical priests that minister before me. What do, what do we do with that phrase? In verse 22 there, I will multiply the offspring of David and, and, the, and the priestly order. Well, Peter speaks to that in 1 Peter chapter 2. We are a royal priesthood. Look what he says there. But you are a chosen race. Now, what is important about being called a chosen race is because God chooses Friend, I'm sorry. God chooses. You don't choose God. We don't go around choosing our God. Now, there are people who try to do that. They get themselves in all kinds of trouble. I know people who have chosen their God, and they're in trouble. We don't choose our God. God chooses us. Jesus said it to His disciples. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I chose you to go and do good works to give your Father in Heaven that you bear those good fruits that your Father be glorified. I chose you. It says in, in Ephesians, we were chosen before the foundation of the world. We don't choose God. In fact, left to ourselves, we never choose God, not the God that is God. We choose something else, something that looks like us, or something we can manipulate. This is what Peter says. You are a chosen race. If we're part of the chosen people of God. We're the chosen people of God. A royal priesthood. We're, not, we're sons and daughters of the king. That makes us royalty. But we are also priests able to offer acceptable sacrifice to God in Christ. Our prayers, therefore, are accepted. Our praise is accepted. Our work with the poor is accepted. Our charity, everything we do, our living, our work that we work with our hands is acceptable before God is our life. Why? Because we belong to Him. He chose us. We're righteous in Him by faith. Now, I may do the work exactly as someone else's does. But since this person is working for himself, is it giving glory to God? Does he work for righteousness' sake or for his own sake? That's the point. He says, you are that. Then he says, you're a holy nation. You're a holy, chosen race, a holy nation. A people for his possession. We belong to him. We belong to God. We don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to our society. is not our native home. We are to serve there because we're His stewards. But we belong to Him. We belong to Him. That, and this is our role. Now, now what do we do? Well, Peter says here, because of this, because of what Jeremiah prophesied would happen in the house of David and with regard to the lineage of David, and because of the coming of Jesus Christ, 
uh, which we celebrated Crespin since his birthday. And because of all of this that, it, that, that has happened uh, in the history of the salvation of the world, and what will come, as we read about it in the book of Revelation, his coming on the clouds of heaven. When we read about all of this, what does this mean? It gives us something to do that is important. He called he, that you, you, may proclaim the excellences or the greatness of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We live as children of the light. We live in the light of Christ. And that is why light dominates Advent and the Christmas season. Light dominates it. It doesn't dominate it because it's winter. Okay? That's just a, a, the way that nature kind of helps us as an object lesson. It's because it is light. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. Once you were not a people. Why? Because you weren't chosen. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy. That is, you were still under the wrath of God, not having received the forgiveness of sins because of a lack of faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But now you have received that. And now you have received mercy because of that. Once you had no mercy, now you have received the mercy. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. So he takes really the theme of what Jeremiah had promised way back there in 33. And here Peter is saying, that's you and me. That's where we are. That's where we live as the people of God. We live in this relationship. Our advent is really about the second coming of this Messiah for which we have already uh, given our allegiance and for whom we have already, uh, from whom we have already received our salvation. Because that's what the king, when he comes, was supposed to do. That's what the righteous branch in, in, in Jeremiah 33 was supposed to do. And that was bring security, that is uh, salvation, eternal security. And that's what we have in Jesus. So we see the prophet already, and that is why you have the prophets. You have the prophets quoted over and over and over again in the Gospels. You know, if you had the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, everything that Jesus ever did, and never had one quote from the Old Testament, then we could really literally say, well, no, we're people of the New Testament. We wouldn't even have the Old Testament scriptures in the Bible. We wouldn't have them. It wouldn't be. Why would we need them? If all that is important is what, what, what we have in the Gospels, you see. And people make that mistake. A lot of people make that mistake with regard to categorizing Christianity. You know, there were somehow people of the New Testament. No, we're people of the Bible. Because it was all there. Jesus, when He came into the world, what did He say to His, to his disciples when he, he came? He said in Luke 24, so He's risen from the dead, and He has now appeared to His disciples. And what does He say? What does He say? Okay, boys, don't worry about the law. Don't worry about the Torah. Don't worry about the prophets. They don't mean anything anymore. Focus on Me. Focus on Me. Now, if you think He said that, raise your hand. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. This is what he says in Luke chapter 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Now listen to what he says here. These were my words which I spoke to you when I was still with you. And that means before the death and resurrection. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, and the Psalms there means all the other writings, okay? In the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Gospels, the New Testament, no, the Scriptures. The Scriptures. Everyone who came to faith in Jesus Christ before the first penning of the gospel, okay, in the middle of the first century, before that ever happened, all those, they think over a million people coming to faith in Jesus Christ had come to faith in Jesus Christ because of the Old Testament. They came to faith in Jesus Christ by the Old Testament. It wasn't until after that that they wrote the Scriptures and then Paul wrote the Scriptures and these guys began to write about Jesus and how he did what? Fulfilled the prophets and the Old Testament. Notice this, my words that I spoke to you has fulfilled everything that had been written. 
Jesus, when he spoke, he spoke as the prophet, the last prophet. He, by the way, was the last prophet, not that guy who showed up in the 7th century. Okay? He was the last prophet of God. And he says it's all been fulfilled. And we must understand the scriptures this way. And so that is why we can, that is why even in our liturgy we, we, we read Jeremiah. We read what he said here. Because this is exactly what has happened. It happened. It happened in the very short term when, when the Jews returned back from Babylon. It happened in the little bit longer term when they were restored to the land after World War II. It, it has happened also again in, in the spread of the church uh, throughout the whole world. And now it will ultimately, ultimately be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah on the clouds of heaven with all his holy angels. You see? So Advent time, this Advent time is a very important time for us to understand that the God we worship, the God who has chosen us by the power of the Spirit and faith in Jesus Christ, that that God has been absolutely true to His Word. And He has done it every time. He cannot be held in objection to anything He did not fulfill. He did it all. And I will trust that God to fulfill His final thing that the angels said to the disciples as they stood on the mountain of, of, of Ascension and said to Him, Men of Galilee, why stand you here looking up? Do you not know that the one you have seen taken up will come even as you have seen Him go? And that is the one that we anticipate. Amen? Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus even to life everlasting. Amen.